Welcome to All About Boston. I'm Catherine O'Neill, and tonight our guest is the top cop of the city of Boston, Commissioner William Evans. And Commissioner, thank you very much for joining us on All About Boston well, tonight. thanks for having me on. This is my first interview with you. Yes. And you've had a busy, busy public service life. Yeah. Since you've been, you really have dedicated your life to the citizens of the city of Boston starting in 1982. 1980, right? Yeah, as a cadet. I as started, a cadet. Yeah. So 36 years. I just started on November 1st was my 30, started my 35th as actually a, a uniformed officer. Let's talk a little bit about your backstory. Um, you grew up in South Boston. Yep. You had kind of a sad childhood. You lost your mom and your dad and your brother. Right. And uh, you were raised by four of your yeah, brothers. Right. My older brothers took good care of me. And you went to St. Sebastian's. Talk a little bit how a South Boston kid got to St. Sebastian's. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, once my father died, a local priest, uh, Father White and Paul White from Gate of Heaven. I was in Gate of Heaven Parish. Like, you know, South Boston kids, that's how we identify, oh. like Dorchester. And, um, you know, after my dad died, he was worried about what direction I was going in. There was a lot of turmoil in the city then. You know, busing was ready to start, and he walked up to my brothers and said, you know, I'm worried about William. And he says, I'd like to see him get into a good school. And he paved the way, you know, for me to get into St. Sebastian. So obviously, um, we didn't have the money to send um, me to a school like that. Or, and I always joke, I, I don't think I had the brains to get in there. But he threw me a lifeline, and you know I took three buses every day to get to the school because it was on the Bright Newton line at that time, and uh, you know I went there and I graduated, and I always look back and say I owe a, a lot of gratitude to Father White, and it sort of shaped my philosophy of policing. Uh, when I see a lot of the kids in the neighborhoods that don't have a whole lot, I always say these are the kids we have to reach out to. They, we're the ones we got to give them a lifeline an opportunity like I got, because there's no such thing as a bad kid out there. It's just a kid who needs the right opportunity. And it was just that one action by that local priest yeah. that you believe changed the trajectory of what could have been your life, Well, it right? got me a great education, yeah. which I think, uh, you know, I continually try to stress with my three children, and, you know, when I go around speaking to a lot of neighbor, you know, a lot of school groups, and I read in a lot of the schools how important it is to get a good education and you know because of that education you know, I always did well on my promotional exams and kept up with the laws the constitutional um, laws and and um, you know I owe a lot of it to the, the education that St. Sebastian's got me. So after St. Sebastian's you went out of state for college talk yeah. about that. Well I went to Chaminade University in Hawaii and I, I don't know what I, what I was sort of thinking at the time but you know, my brother John was at my last brother who wasn't married. I was living with him, believe it or not. And then he was getting married in August, and I had no place to go. I, you know, he, I could have lived with him and his new wife, but I, I don't think she would appreciate that. So I said, I'm going to get away. And I, I went to Chaminade University. Um, I, I went for a while, but sort of got homesick. And I came back here, went to Suffolk University, graduated a uh, uh, government major there, and... Uh, you know, then that's when, while I was at Suffolk, I became a Boston police cadet. So I was doing. So you cadet. went to work. You worked full time, and you went to school full time. Right, right. So you have an incredible work ethic. Everybody that knows you knows yeah. that about you. Yeah. Well, it's good. You know, my father, God bless him. You know, he raised. He, when my mom died, he had six boys left, all under the age of eleven, and uh, he instilled some good values in it. And you know, obviously working hard looking out for each other, and, and uh, you know, all my brothers, you know, um, my brother, oldest brother obviously was the police commissioner. I had my brother John and James were district and deputy chiefs on the fire, and my brother Tom is on NSTAR, and he's done well, so, you know. So you joined the police department officially in 1982. Yeah. And you're a patrol officer for five years. Yeah, right. And while you're a patrol officer, you are awarded the Boston Police Medal of Honor yeah. for thwarting a robbery, right? Yeah, out in Austin, right, and we had um, three individuals hold up the McDonald's out down by uh, Western Ave, Soldiers yep. Field Road, and 
you know, with a sawed-off shotgun. And my partner, Jimmy Cook, who's now retired, we were able to, with the help of other officers, able to apprehend him. So that was probably, uh, you know, the highlight of the, you know, of a lot of the um, sort of as a patrolman anyway. So then you start taking police exams, right. promotional exams, and you ace all of the exams, right? You well, I scored, study hard. You scored the highest yeah. in the sergeant's exam, right? right. Yeah. The highest score. Yeah. And then that was in 1987. Yeah. And then in 1992, you took the lieutenant yeah. exam, and you yeah. did... Top five, I yeah, think. Yeah, particularly then, well yeah. in that. Yeah. And then you ace the captain's exam. Right. Well, I was, I, I was, you know, again, I, I learned good study habits at St. Sebastian's. I was determined, and uh, I think it's the personality. You know, I'm a big marathoner, and, I, you know, if I set my sights on a goal, I, 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 I almost go to the extreme, you know. My wife always says to me, you're not normal, because <laughs> I used to sit there at 12 hours at a time, and she used to get me a cup of tea and put up with me, but... You know, I, I, if I set my eye on something, I'm usually all out towards it. And, you know, after six months of straight studying, you know, and I remember going to Disney with my three kids and I had the books open and my wife was ready to kill me. Uh, but, you know, it, now I look back and it's, it, it was all worth it. Well, but, I just, I mentioned that, Commissioner, because as you're making your way in the Boston Police Force, um, Beginning on, you know, the yeah. bottom level, right. you have a brother right. that's on the Boston police force, and he is also rising through the right. ranks. Right. So was that a difficult, because I'm sure our viewers probably remember that Commissioner Evans's brother was also Commissioner right. Evans. Right. And I think you're... The, I'm the better commissioner, so that's just for the record. I, I just <laughs> joke with him all the time, you know. I think you're the only set of brother commissioners in the United States of America. I'm pretty sure. Is that true? Well, uh, of a major city. Of a major city, uh, yeah, At yeah, least yeah. that I know of, uh, according to, like, Chuck Wexter and others. But, you know, he, he's been a good mentor to me. And oh, he must he have He still been. is. You know, we all still live in South Boston. And when I run into difficult situations, you know, it's always good to be able to pick up the phone and, oh, and get his opinion. Oh, it must be great. Yeah. yeah. So, now, did you get any... Because I imagine that, you know, you're continually getting promoted because you're acing these right. exams. And, and of course, everybody's suspect that my brother's given me the answers right. to the questions. That's and, right. But there's a lot of, there was a lot of pressure on me because, you know, my brother had done so well. And, but I always remember, you know, everyone always said, just get in front of him and you'll get made. And, and so, uh, but I studied hard. And, and my wife, I remember um, when she heard some of that, she's <laughs> like, I'll, you know, like, I'll kill them. She knows how hard I studied, and to the point where I was giving up my running, which is the most important thing, just because I didn't want to waste the time of the day um, getting away from the book. So, you know, so now you've run 50 marathons, right. correct? Yeah. 50 marathons. Yeah, yeah. And I hope to do, I'm, I'm supposed to run New York this weekend, so I'm hoping to get, drive down Saturday night and run. So we'll really? see. It's important, you know. I think that's my... Stress relief, obviously. I love to run. It's, it's the only time I'm sort of off the phone and out there right. thinking, about, can get you. Yep. thinking about what I have to do that day, the challenges. And, uh, you know, it's a good stress release for me. So let's talk about So you do really well in the captain's exam, and you get, um, you're the captain of Alston Brighton. Right. So you begin, you realize that you have a huge student population. Right. There are 75,000 people in your district, and most of your um, problems are town and gown. Right. So you begin this new thing of taking these college folks out on ride arounds right, right. with you. Talk about that. No, I want to get out there. You know, the whole idea is community policing is you listen to what the community um, wants you to prioritize, and you work with them to come up with solutions. And, and, and Obviously, underage drinking and loud parties was the big issue. So we wanted the schools to take a lot more accountability for their students. Just because they're living off campus doesn't mean they're not yours. So, you know, we asked BC, BC with Bill Mills uh, and Tom Keedy up there about a make, good crew. Yeah, making, you know, for them to help out and ride along with us. And they also paid for ve extra vehicles 
to patrol, you know, the whole Chestnut Hill area up there with most of their students. And then um, if we ran into a kid who had problems, then we'd turn the name right over to the administrators and they could take internal disciplinary action. And that's worked real well to the point where BU replicated it, Suffolk University, and so it's been able to get the neighborhoods uh, better under control. And those, those programs continue, you know, where the schools have taken greater responsibility for the behavior of students off campus. And you began that program. Yeah, yeah. So then you get promoted to... Well, I went down to District 4 as the captain. Oh, okay, in the south end. In the south end, That's Back right. Bay, Lower Roxbury, where I, I was down there for three, year, three or four years, and it just shows you the difference in priorities. You know, as a captain out in Brighton, it was all about students. When I went down to District 4 in the south end, there was all kinds of different issues, you know, dealing obviously with homelessness because of Pine Street, right. uh, obviously up around the Fenway, dealing with the GBLT and some of the issues around, you know, people who might have... Um, prejudiced against the gay population, uh, and obviously, you know, some violence in the neighborhood. There was a couple of the violent, you know, developments around yeah. Lenox Cathedral, which are a lot better now, but, you know, a whole lot different issues given the neighborhood, and those were some of the things the neighbor, neighbors wanted me to address down there. So in my 13 years, well, 12 years as captain, um, you know, different priorities in different neighborhoods. Did you like being captain? Oh, I loved it. Loved I loved it. it. Uh, you know, you became part of the community. Um, I was out in community meetings. Um, you know, I kept a good watch on the bars, a closing hours, capacity, and you really got to build some strong relationships. And I remember being out in Brighton. That's when I was young and I was just having my children. People used to bake me pies, bring in presents for my, my like, teddy bears when I was having the kids. And, you know, Austin Brighton was always, it always was and always will be special to me. And same with down the South End. And then when I became a superintendent after that, you know, in charge of all the patrol, um, it was a job I really liked. But I, so I, for our audience, yeah. you were, so you were, after the South End, you went to, you were the superintendent of all uniformed right. police officers. Yeah, Commissioner right. Davis and Mayor Menino, who was, who was you know, um, a great mayor. Uh, you know, he... Um, um, you know, they put me in that position of being a superintendent. And, um, you know, it, it was a whole different responsibility. Uh, you know, I used to have the pager, and I, all I cared about was, was it on my district? When I got that job, it was all on my district. Right, so right. greater responsibility. But what I missed about that is I didn't really have my own community that was manageable. All of a sudden, they had the whole city. So I didn't get to as many community meetings. I didn't really have that sense of, owning a district, and that's what I missed about it. But I loved the job because I got to deal with uh, deploying offices. I got to do with, you know, if the president was coming to town, setting up the operational plans. But, you know, as a captain, that's the job that I think everyone strives for, being head of all the uniform. And, you know, I dealt with the Occupied Boston. Hey, let's talk about that, yeah. because you dealt with Occupied Boston differently than other major right. cities. Our occupied Boston, we never had a problem. Right. And that was because of you, basically. Right. And everybody yeah. will say that because yeah. of your... Well, it, it wasn't just because of me. It was because of but the great... But how you treat these... Yeah. But, I mean, the officers people. did a great job down there, too. I mean, they bought into how we should, um, you know, communicate. And, you know, a lot of those kids down there, you know, they had a legitimate reason for protest. And, you know, they were protesting how high the tuitions were, you know, the practices of big banks. And, uh, and you know, I think we all get impacted. You know, I've had kids, you know, I'm, pay, I'm paying pretty good college tuitions. And so, you know, um, you know they, they were the 99%. That was their chant. We're the 99. And I think all us policemen were 99. So we could relate to them. And I think we got to know them. Uh, you know, they, we exchanged phone numbers. And, uh, they had your cell phone. But, I remember but, that yeah. vividly. Yeah, and, they, w and we had a great relationship. So when it came time to, to get them um, out of there, you know, it was easy because we got to talk to them. We didn't have helmets, sticks on. They left and flacked. I remember it very much. Um, when we were removing them, I was pleading with a few of them not to get locked up. But symbolically, they wanted to. There was one guy 
Duncan McKenna, who I kept at pleading with him, Duncan, don't go in the wagon. We don't want to lock you up. And, but he was determined. And a couple of years later, I was writing him a recommendation to help him get into graduate school at Northeastern, believe it or not. So I built some good, as, as, cra as, as crazy as some people think they were, there was some real well-educated kids who had a legitimate cause. And, you know, I, I still see them, and I'm still friendly with them. So did he call you up and ask sure. you? Sure, yeah. He did. Yeah, and I went and had coffee, and I wrote him a recommendation, um, you know, and um, so I, I built some good relationships out of that. And while you were the, um, in charge, the superintendent, yeah. you know, a dark part of our history in Boston is the Boston Marathon. Sure. And um, you were running that day right. in 2013, and... Um, Talk about your experience with that day. Well, again, you know, that's, you know, I, I think it will always be a, an emotional day, an emotional week for all of our department, who I thought did a tremendous job given what happened to the city. Um, you know, I think, you know, I had run that race, uh, you know. Uh, uh, I had started out in Hopkinton at 10, and I did it in 3 hours and 34, so I actually finished at 1.34 in the afternoon. The bombs went off at 2.48, so... I was in the hot tub down at the Boston Athletic Club when they came and got me. And, uh, you know, to go back to that scene after I had just run down the street an hour or so early, it was, you know, a, a sort of a memory that I'll never get out of my mind. You went See, home and put your uniform yeah, on and went yeah. back to that yeah. finish and, line. Yeah, and I think 10 p.m. the next night was the first time I got home. And so, um, you know, it was a long, uh, long, long four or five days. But, you know, I'm... People always say to me, what's probably the worst thing you've ever seen? And I think coming back to that finish line and seeing, you know, uh, the destruction, you know, the banners torn apart, you know, obviously the young bodies lying on the street. And so um, that was a tough day, you know. And I, I always look back being a marathoner and have, being a lifelong city resident is, you know, uh, those two guys blew up our city, they blew up our marathon, and they injured and killed a lot of people who, um, you know, that we'll never, ever be able to bring back. And you went on to be in charge of the Watertown. Um, yeah, yeah. We were out searching since, you know, the Watertown had to shoot out, and we stayed out again. Was that the next day? Or? No, it was, thir it was Thursday, Thursday. Thursday okay. night going into Friday. And so I, I, I was in charge of Watertown as far as on the street, Chief Linsky and... Uh, Commissioner Davis moved to the Watertown Mall, so all day long I, I sort of ran the show out in Watertown. And when um, when uh, Governor Patrick had released the stay in place order, uh, Captain Davin, who is in charge of our special oper operations, still wanted to continue the search. So we continued to search despite a lot of people leaving. And that's when someone ran up to me and said, "We're getting a report of someone in the boat." And, Literally, myself, Bobby Myrna, Lieutenant, and Paul O'Connor, we were the first ones on that boat, and we ran that whole scene. Uh, and with the help of, you know, the FBI, um, you know, their uh, hostage recovery team and other agencies, we were able to safely get him out of the boat. Um, you know, uh, there were some shots fired. By all lot, accounts yeah. that I read, Commissioner, you were the one that insisted on not firing any well, shots. Well, when the shots rang out, I was the one screaming for everyone to stop firing because, you know, uh, number one, obviously, um, we, didn't, I, we didn't need him killed because we uh, obviously had a lot of information to gain from him because we didn't know how big an operation this whole terrorist cell was. And uh, obviously, also, you know, I was afraid of... Uh, anyone getting hurt, believe it or not. So well, th thank God we were able to get him out of there. Um, you know, we were able uh, to get information out of him that I think was helpful. And, uh, and you know, it, it's, you know, it, again, it was an emotional week. I always look back and say, um, you know, I hope uh, nothing like that ever happens again in the city. Uh, but, uh, you know, it, 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 I always still feel for, the, you know, the Richards family, the Campbell family, the Lou family, and obviously Sean Collier's family, because I know there's a movie coming out and all that, but, um, you know, it, it's, they, they'll never, ever get back their loved ones on that. And right. a lot of people lost limbs uh, and f will be forever, 
impaired by what happened on that day. I'm just glad at the end of the week we were able to get the two individuals who were responsible for that. It doesn't feel like a good segue after right. talking about the Boston Marathon bombing. Um, so after that incident, you were appointed acting commissioner, is that correct? Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, Commissioner Davis left um, in November, and actually I just had started my fourth year, um, November 1st. Um, Mayor Menino made me the acting commissioner, and it's sort of interesting because my last day on, in uniform was the night that the Red Sox won the World Series. So oh, were you there? I was running outside and around the park, and we were pushing crowds all night long. And then the next day I find out the mayor, Menino, calls me and says, you're the acting commissioner. And my first day um, on the job was the day of the parade, um, the World <laughs> Series parade. And so I, you, you have been initiated by fire your whole mm, career, yeah. right? Like, well, that was interesting because... I always joke, you know, I had probably one suit at the time because when you're a, a police officer, you wear the same outfit every day. That dark blue outfit, and you have the clip-on tie, and you can spill anything on it. And, and so right. I always laugh. People say, what was, what was the most difficult part of the transition? I said, I had to go find outfits to wear every day. And so, so, <laughs> so you know, funny. So that started it. But, you know, I owe Mayor Walsh a, a debt of gratitude. You know, he... He made me the permanent commissioner, and let me tell you, um, he's a great guy. Uh, you guys are a lot alike. Yeah, yeah, and he's, the, he's okay. not only my boss, he's, a, he's a, a good pal, a good buddy. We always joke about, you know, South Boston kid being better than a Dorchester kid, and we go back, I can but, imagine. you know, Mayor Walsh, he didn't have a whole lot. He overcame a lot of obstacles. A lot of similarities. You know, the cancer, yeah. the addiction, you know, he didn't have a whole lot, and so... We, I like to say, we hit it off very well. And, you know, uh, people always say, how long are you going to stay in this job? And I say, as long as Mayor Walsh wants me to, because he's a great mayor. He really cares deeply for the residents of this city, and I enjoy so much working for him. So you have a good relationship with Mayor oh, Walsh? Oh, excellent. He's the best. Okay, so now that's your backstory. Now let's talk about Commissioner Evans. I mean, if we talked about just the month of October, right. we, we would be out of time. But, okay, so you believe in transparency. That's, your, that's the drum that you beat all the time, right. transparency and communication. And when you see um, young people, that's where you believe the um, change can happen, right? Yeah. Like, for instance, our shootings are down 17% this year. Right? Oh. And that's because your work, the police department is working with our residents right. and our younger people, right? Yeah. So we've had a tough month. Right. Let's talk about October. No, it's been tough. You know, you know, in East Boston, we had two officers shot on Gladstone Street there. You know, that was a tough night. And, and thank know, God they're okay, right? Yeah, they're okay. And today, actually, in our media room, uh, we have Comstat every other Thursday. We had in the two doctors who were very instrumental in saving those officers' life, and we gave them an award this morning for oh, doing good. that. Yeah, uh, uh, Dr. Vamajos, George Vamajos, who's chief of trauma at MGH, and Dr. David King, who is also he's a lieutenant colonel in the army and has done a lot of battle wounds of soldiers over in Af Afghanistan and Iraq. We were just fortunate both of those uh, doctors were uh, on duty and able to work with our officers, and uh, we're very fortunate. They had some real serious injuries, but down at Mass General, they had the best care. And so, you know, that was tough, that, you know. Seeing the two-year-old, you know, I was at, at there, and I visited the two-year-old in the hospital after... So a two-year-old was shot, uh, what date was that now? That was October... Nine. Yeah, yeah, that October was tough, 9. you know, and, uh, you know, and, you know, that, that's a tough one, you know, uh, that shouldn't happen in our city, and I know, um, you know, I was a little emotional da down there saying, asking for people's help and that people weren't cooperating, but, you know, when, we, we can't tolerate that happening in the city. Has anybody stepped forward to cooperate yeah, at this not, point? Not what, like we'd like, want to, you know, we, yeah. we put out some pitches 
of the individual riding the motorcycle with the beard that we think was responsible. But, you know, but we're still working on it. We're hoping to get, you know, and we're slowly but surely building a case without the cooperation, to tell you the truth. And I know you can't talk about this probably because it's under investigation right. by the Suffolk County District Attorney's Office. Yeah. But there was an incident uh, two days ago, yeah. October 31st, where um, yeah. EMTs were involved. Talk yeah. about that. Yeah, again, I, I really can't get can't, into okay. it. You know, uh, you know, it's unfortunate. I always say any time we take a life, um, you know, it, 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 it hurts us. Uh, I know the officers um, never, ever want to have to pull the trigger, but when their lives are in danger, uh, you know, by law, we have every right to do it. And so, you know, I don't want to get into the yeah, specifics no, totally. of the I case, yep. but it shows the dangers of our job. You know, we went to a domestic violence call in East Boston not suspecting anything, and it turned ugly real quick. But it also highlights to Commissioner the dangers that EMTs right. face. And all first responders, right? right? Yeah, because they, they never know, you know. Do so they carry guns? I know that. No, 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 they don't. And, you know, they're out there. Uh, I always say, you know, they save so many people every day. Uh, you know, uh, when we have shooting victims, it's their response, getting there, getting them quickly down to hospitals. We got great trauma centers, such as Boston Medical Center, that usually if we can get them there, they work miracles. And so... You know, the EMTs are a big part of our strategies. And, you know, and, you know, whether they're dealing with people with mental health, like we seen the other night, or dealing with the homeless, or, uh, you know, the drug addicted, which we're seeing more and more uh, with the opiates and the knocking and administering that, they, they do God's work. And yeah. we're just fortunate uh, that those two EMTs weren't uh, seriously hurt that, that night. But, you know, together with the fire, the EMTs, we all work to make this city a better place. Talk a little bit about um, question four on the ballot with the marijuana. Is that going to affect the bond? If that passes, is that? Tell me what. Well, obviously, I'm I'm against it. You know, uh, you know, I think um, we have enough problems and enough drug issues in the city that we really can't get a firm grasp on. I mean, go down to Mass and Mass Ave and. Uh, you know, Molina Cass and Mass and that area, and you see all the clinics and how we're trying our best to address that issue. But, you know, the last thing we need to do is introduce another drug. I'm firmly behind, and I know the mayor is, uh, the whole idea of the medical marijuana and giving it for medical purposes. But, you know, to, to have it so accessible that young kids are going to be experimenting, uh, people are going to be driving, where we really don't have a test right. to basically... It's so new that to, to sort of, you know, have sanctions against people driving on the influence. And so, you know, and, uh, you know, the studies I've read, uh, I just was listening to the radio the other day on, in Colorado, and all these babies being born have THC in their system. So I, I know a lot of people say it's harmless, but um, I don't think it's harmless. I think once people use that, they're going to move on to another drugs. They're going to uh, continually get impaired and you know I, I don't want kids going to high school you know high and you know I think it's going to cause a lot of health problems and other issues that you know I read today there could be as many as 50 of them in the city right. uh, you know wow I, I can't believe that so we want people walking around high all the time and don't tell me it's not going to get in the hands of kids 13 14 15 16 it, the more you make it that much more planable you know, people are going to get access to it, especially with 50 of them in the city. Right. They really are. And I watched um, 60 Minutes on Sunday, and yeah. there was an ER doctor from a hospital in Colorado, uh, and he said, do not legalize uh, it. It is not a good yeah, thing. Because yeah, yeah. all of the babies right. have THC, and, not all of them. And I always say, if we're, going to do it to make, if, if we're going to do it to make money because of the tax revenue, then we're doing it for the absolute wrong reason. Right. This ain't about um, making money. It's about people's health. And I'm all for people who really need it getting it because right now we have two medical marijuana right. facilities and we have no issues there. But if we let it go out throughout the neighborhoods and um, be in certain neighborhoods that already have enough problems, then uh, I, I don't know why we're going down this road because, 
It, it, right now, it's a non-criminal matter if you're caught with marijuana. You know, it's a civil infraction, you know, and so we really don't take any action against someone. So if you really want to have access to it, you can. But, but the, other, the other argument against, I mean, for legalization is folks are saying that uh, when arrested, that minorities are arrested with intent to distribute. Right. That that's the tag on it. Yeah. But, but we're going to take a short break, yeah, all right? Okay. We'll be right back. We're back with Commissioner Evans, and Commissioner Evans, we only have five more minutes. Okay. So let's talk about, if you will, the body camera issue. Right. A lot of people are talking about that. Now, I will say one other thing about uh, the EMT issue that two nights ago, they didn't have body cameras right. on. That's correct. So talk about... Well, you know, that station has body cameras, but, uh, you know, the, the morning watch shift in those offices didn't have it. And, you know, we still have to iron out whether... You know, one of the policy requirements is when we go across people's threshold into their private residence, we will ask permission. And to have the camera on. To have the camera on because okay. we don't want to violate people's rights. So looking at this particular case, that's something we're going to have to look at, whether we have to change the policy. So if we can dealing with an emotionally disturbed person in the offices have the camera, do we want them on? But... You know, the cameras are working out well. I so mean, what happens? The officer has the camera. At uh, first, you couldn't get anybody to volunteer. Right, right. So but you again, had a little bit of a dust-up with the police union, yeah. right? Well, and again, I don't think the union disagreed so much as if it's just a change. You know, a change comes hard in any organization. In policing, it even comes hard. I think it was a change in their working conditions. But now that they have them on... You know, I'm hearing a lot of positive so things So what happens? About. They put them on, yeah. and they just go about their business. Yeah, well, it, we don't want them on all the time. When they get a dispatch call, they will, when they start get out of the vehicle and start to interact with the public, they'll put them on. When the incident's over, they'll shut them off, and they'll mock that incident is how they do it. So it's not on when they are driving about their regular job. They activate it should they pull over a motor vehicle, or they have an encounter on the street. They, so they have the ability to put them on and off. Certain situations we don't want them on, such as domestic when you're inside someone's house, because um, you really don't want that unless you know, they give you permission once you go over the threshold. Um, sexual assault victims, we don't like it on because you're sort of re-victimizing them. You know, if we have someone who doesn't really want to give us information. It's hard enough now for someone to come forward. It's hard to be a police officer these days, oh, right? Yeah, it's Two difficult. police officers are gunned down last night in right. Cedar Rapids. Right. I mean, it's just, you're under like assault almost. Yeah. Well, it's tough. You know, unfortunately, there's been some real bad, troubling incidents where, you know, some uh, African Americans have been shot by officers, yeah. and, and that troubles me. But unfortunately, when it happens across the country, um, you know, with social media and every, you know, everyone looks at that and says, hey, all police are doing that. You know, I think I have a great department. I always say uh, sometimes people give me credit, but I only get the credit because the men and women in this department do such a great job every well, one day. One thing you do get credit for, Commissioner Evans, is um, people, people actually uh, complain about the makeup, the ethnic makeup right. of the Boston police force. Now, in order to be a police officer, you have to take the civil service right. exam, right? So you don't have any hiring power at all. No, no. All I can do, and we're doing, and the mayor, thank God, you know, sees, he's great. We're hiring a, a cadet class within the next right. two weeks. They're going to be coming out. And that allows us at least to get um, kids from all around the neighborhood who actually uh, have lived in the city for five years. So that's going to help our diversity. But where you can make a difference in diversity is your command staff. Yeah. And you have yeah. a 50% yeah. mi minority command yeah, staff. That, First know, time ever, right? right? And my chief, Will, Will, Willie Grass, does an unbelievable job. He's a great guy. He has the respect of the whole troops. Superintendent Halstead um, runs the night command. Lisa Holmes runs our academy. You know, Joe Harris... It, you know, Nora Bastian, Nora Mariella, uh, you know, Michael Cox, they all do a great job. And uh, I think, 
because of that, uh, you know, uh, we're very good at community policing because we're all out in the neighborhood. We're on peace walks. We're on ice cream trucks. Ice cream You're trucks. All over the place. Coffee with a yeah. cop. You know, <laughs> Mother's Day walk, Father's Day walk, youth police dialogues. I don't think anyone tries as hard um, at community policing. If you had a do. magic wand, what would be the one thing you would do? If I had a, you know, uh, I will stop the violence on the street. Yeah. Nothing bothers me more than seeing young kids shot senselessly every day on the street. The other day, I was out on Washington Street by uh, Moore Street, and we had a 35-year-old woman just walking down the street who got caught in the crossfire of kids shooting at each other, and she got killed. And, you know, when I'm out there and I see that, when I see two-year-old, so if I had a magic wand, I'd, what I'd ask for is no violence in the city. And obviously, relationships... Uh, between police and communities of color, obviously, uh, were a lot stronger and, and, and there was a lot more trust and respect. Well, just like um, um, the 99% will occupy Boston, yeah. uh, in Boston, the Black Lives Matter issue, you're walking with them uh, and supporting them. So there has been no real... Yeah, but, you know, again, uh, you know... It, 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 unfortunately, I've always said Boston's not immune to it, our job's so difficult that we make split-second decisions. And, you know, um, we try hard, yeah. you know, and it takes a lot for us to ever have to pull that trigger. They're highly trained. Um, they're, they're trained in de-escalation, unconscious bias, in dealing with the mentally ill. They undergo extensive training in the academy. So we put out a great, great police force, and I think um, no one does it better. Well, we would like to thank you for joining us on all about Boston and would love you to come back. Will no, you consider no. coming back and updating us? Sure. Thank you very much. We'll be right back with Mike Dean.